And so we're in we're in Mark chapter 12, verse 35 through 44. There's three, there's three different snippets here, uh, and it's real simple. We'll give you an outline for that, even though there's three different things talked about. It's pretty simple. The first thing that you're going to look at is Jesus... Um, He kind of clarifies his identity. Three C's. He clarifies his identity. And that's in the first part where it talks about the Messiah, 35 through 37. Then in verses 38 through 40, where it talks about the warning to the teachers in the law, he condemns the Pharisees and their false religion. He tells us how to not be like that. His disciples watching and us too. And then finally, in the widow's might, as it's often called, the widow's offering, verses 41 through 44, Jesus commends proper and good religion. So you got his clarification of his, of his identity, who he is, condemnation of false religion, and then commendation of true religion. And that's your three C's that kind of outline what we're going to talk about. This is what it says. While Jesus was teaching the temple courts, he asked, Why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? Verse 36, David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under my feet, under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened to him, that's Jesus, with delight. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the Pharisees of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with, with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the place of honor at banquets. Verse 40, they devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. And then verse 41, as Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were being put in, that's in the temple, and watching the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury, many rich people threw in large amounts. Verse 42, but a poor widow came and put in two, two very small coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their great wealth, but she, out of her great poverty, she put in everything, all that she had to live on. In this passage that kind of closes out Jesus' public sermon ministry, he's no longer going to be given big open public sermons anywhere else in the book of Mark. He will now be restrained to smaller groups like his disciples or in a house or or something like that. And so things kind of change. And as we, as we look at that idea of clarity and condemnation and then commendation, it made me think of how that works out in our own lives, right? You've probably thought a little bit about it. Uh, if, you've, if you just give it just a few seconds of thought. I, I thought about how it worked out in my own life. Practically, as a child, my father would often do this. He would do these three things. He would say, gentlemen, talking to me and my brothers, uh, I need to go to town and do whatever. Work on mom's car, do this, that, and the other, take the pig in, you know, whatever it is. So, and then, so that was the clarity, okay? So he says, I got to go do this, and your task is to chop this much wood. He laid out the task, he clarified it. And then he said, I will be back by three. And when I get back by three, if that wood is not chopped, and quartered out the way it's supposed to be to be burned, then, and you insert the hammer that's coming, right, okay? You figure that out. That's the condemnation. However, if you guys finish this, then tonight we will go and do some fun thing. We'll go fishing in the morning. We'll have some ice cream. We'll, you know, whatever. So it kind of, you know, just kind of fleshed itself out like that in my everyday life where you kind of clarify something. You say what you shouldn't do and what you should do. And Jesus kind of does this here. Now remember, this is, this is Passion Week. This is Holy Week. We already looked at Monday. This is still Tuesday where Jesus is looking on. And then on, he's going to have the Lord's Supper on Thursday. And then he's going to be crucified for six hours on the cross on Friday, be buried in the tomb, and then rise from the dead on that glorious morning of Sunday that we call Easter that we celebrate here in a few months. And so we're in the middle of Passion Week. It's Tuesday. And, and Jesus kind of begins his time here you can kind of say in today's term, kids say he kind of drops his mic, right? He drops it on them, and then he kind of picks it up and says, this is what we're going to do. He kind of gives them this question. It's kind of a, a riddle of sorts. Why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? And then he explains something from Psalms 110. You know, I, I like riddles. When I was a 
a preschool teacher, or not preschool teacher, I should say a counselor for a preschool and elementary school, when I was an educator, you would get these little first graders that would come up to you in these preschoolers, and they love riddles. So they'd say, Mr. Teal, Mr. Teal. And I'd say, yes. they say, I got a riddle for you. You want to hear it? And what do you got to say to a little kid? <laughs> yes. Now, have you heard them all? Absolutely. By the mid-year, you've heard them all, right? But this kid, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. I got a riddle for you. You want to hear it? Yes. What do you call a fake noodle? Now, I know the answer, and I say, I don't know. What? And he goes, an impasta, <laughs> right? And you're like, oh, that's great, you know? An impasta. What do you call a nosy pepper? Jalapeno, your business, right? Yeah, it's none of your business. It's like, okay, all right, you know, you put a little thought into this. They had another one that they always used to say, how do you take, and I've never forgot this one, how do you take a sick pig to the hospital? In a ambulance. <laughs> yeah, I know, they're dorky, but Jesus has much better riddles than Pastor Greg does or than first graders, right? And his riddle to these scribes is he's challenging their intellectual and religious authority. They remember the two things that are in the book of Mark is Jesus from the very first chapter says, I'm writing this to let you know that Jesus is the Son of God. He is God Almighty, exactly who he says he is. Mark says that in the first chapter. And Jesus is juxtaposition against the religious leaders, and he's trying to test them. Remember, they've been testing him. They had those five big questions for him that we looked at. And then all these things that they threw at him, and Jesus answered with wonderful wisdom, and people were delighted at him. And now it's his turn. He turns it on them, and he asks them this riddle, and he says, as all the people are watching and teaching him, he's teaching the temples, he says, why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? Verse 36, David himself, meaning King David, the Old Testament, speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? Jesus is trying to point these guys, even though they've been against him, and the text has told us that they want to kill him. Remember, he's defeated all their questions. Plan A for them has failed. They're not going to discredit him because he's much wiser, much smarter than them, much godlier. He is God. But... Now they're looking to plan B, which is to kill him. And Jesus is trying to let people know that their wisdom is not wisdom at all. But instead, what I've been telling you about myself as Christ, that's really what's wisdom. And so the Lord said to my Lord, what? Sit at my right hand until your enemies put under your feet, right? So Jesus, he kind of dials up Psalm 110. And when we look at that, we kind of think it's confusing. If you go back and read it, maybe academic, you know, maybe a little bit... Uh, uh, technical, those kinds of things, because it's talking about this king in Psalm 110. It's kind of a, a little bit of a dud to us. And you think to yourself, or at least I did when I was reading this, I was thinking, you know, Jesus, this is your last sermon, and this is the question that you have for these guys? I kind of thought, you know, Jesus would say, don't you guys want to accept me into your hearts? Don't you want to submit yourselves to me? Something like that. But no, Jesus goes to the crux of it. He goes to the crux of it with the religious leaders, and he clarifies, the first point, his identity. He's going to teach them who he is and the nature of himself, right? Now, what's very important for you to understand as we look at Psalms 110 just for a second here is this. It tells us some things about Scripture, okay? Here at Calvary, we have a very high view of Scripture. I just said that. We preach verse by verse through the, the text for a reason, and that's because we believe it's all inspired by the Holy Spirit. In fact, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says... All Scripture is God-breathed, right? And Jesus says in Matthew 4.4 4, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so the Bible, as God's holy word, God's word, the Scriptures, is infallible and authoritative, and so we base our lives upon it, and we have a model for that. Our Lord Jesus models that for us, okay? So I want you to see a couple things. First of all, Jesus believed in the authority of Scripture, right? He views it as God's Word. He goes back to Psalms 110, and he says, God said this. So he says, what's in the Scriptures is God's Word. Jesus, as God himself in human flesh, considered Scripture authoritative. If Jesus, the guy who wrote the Scriptures, <laughs> considers it authoritative, then probably you and I should too, right? 
Now, this is very interesting because this week I had a conversation with a lady who said, I left another church because I heard the pastor say that she did not believe that everything in the scriptures was inspired, just some parts of it. I said, what do you think about that, ma'am? And she said, I think that's wrong. I said, you're right. I said, what's the problem with that? She said, well, Greg, I don't know all that you know, but I think this is the problem with it. How do I pick and choose what I believe and what I don't? And I said, you're the wisest one in the room. Because you can't. All Scripture is inspired by God. It is God-breathed. It proceeds from God. And so Jesus says here, when he says, David himself speaking by the Holy Spirit. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. He claims the authority of God's Word. So if Jesus refers to Scripture, we got to refer to Scripture. And then he says, in the Holy Spirit or by the Holy Spirit, he means that the Holy Spirit inspired it. David inspired, the Holy Spirit inspired David to write Psalm 110 and superintended it and made sure it reflected his heart, the heart of God. So we have authority of the Scriptures. We have the inspiration of the Scriptures. And then we have the unity of the Scriptures, right? When Jesus is talking about himself, we're in the New Testament, what does he refer to? The Old Testament, the book of Psalms, Psalms 110. Jesus shows that the Old and New Testaments are not divided. Often I will hear the argument from people that, well, the New Testament God I can follow, he's loving and good, but that Old Testament guy was pretty mean. No. Jesus, he claims the authority of the Old Testament, and he claims the unity of the Scriptures, old and new. We need to study both, and that's why a few months ago, we studied through the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament because we need to be fed from both Testaments, okay? So Jesus is for the authority of Scripture. He's for the inspiration of Scripture. He's for the unity of Scripture. And then the best part is he expounds on Scripture, okay? The reason we do this in classes and in small group and from the pulpit where we take the text, we read it, and we unpack it, expound on it, is because that's what Jesus did. That was his model. There's nobody that can preach better than Jesus Certainly not me, okay? And so you should be hearing from the Word of God, reading the Word of God, and, 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 and listening to it because that's how it should be done, okay? So Jesus' point, what's his point? His point is that he is greater than David, right? Jesus asks everyone to reconsider their view of Psalms 110. Now, their view was very simple. It's a, it's a song of inauguration of the new king. Now, how many of you watch the inauguration of the, the new president of the United States. I'm not being political, whatever your views are, it's fine. Either way is fine. But it is a wonderful thing to watch that we live in a free country where there is a civil and peaceable transfer of power from one leader to the next, and that there's great sim symbolism around that, and a great bunch of pomp and circumstance, and that so many people go when you have millions of people that went to this one, and millions of people that went to Obama's, and millions of people that went to George W. Bush's, it means that the nation cares about who its leader is, right? And, and we look at those things. Well, Psalms 110 is about the inauguration of the king. It's a song about when the king comes in, that the king sits on his throne, and his throne is at the right hand of God. Now, what does it mean to be at the right hand of God? It means that you have power right? God's the biggest, right? As the kids say, God's the biggest. If you sit at his right hand, you're pretty important, right? You look at coaches, usually they're offensive coordinators, the right hand guys right here, right there with them, right? It's that kind of thing. And so this entire Psalm, Psalm 110, is, is about this inauguration of the king, but it, while it also represents David's inauguration, it also, or David's son, Solomon, it also represents in the future the prophecy about Jesus, Okay, it's kind of looking at it with two lenses. One for Solomon coming into power after David and the other one for King Jesus, the real King of Kings, and Lord of Lords to come. Okay, so that's what he's talking about. And he says, the Lord said to my Lord, right? The first word Lord is Yahweh. We've seen that before. That's how God identifies himself. The great I am, Yahweh. I am who I am. And then the word, second word of Lord is what's called Adonai. You've probably heard that in the great Amy Grant songs, right? Adonai, Adonai that we sing. So the Lord says to my Lord. The Lord God says to Jesus, right? You would not call the king of Israel Adonai. 
The Father, God, says to His Son, Jesus, the second Lord, come and sit at my right hand, right? Until I put all your enemies under your feet, which is a symbolism that He will be the greatest. He will be exalted above everything else. And so the whole unpacking of this passage is about this. Jesus is trying to say, I've been trying to tell you guys, I am the promised Messiah. I am the one that has been prophesied about. The great coming king that you're looking for to come militarily and take over, I'm him, but I'm just not going to do it militarily. I'm going to do it through humility, which he's going to show us in the second point, right? Or in the third point with the widow's might. And not through pride, which he's going to show us in the second point with the religious leaders. But I'm him. And this, and this is the power of it, is, is a couple different things. Jesus is saying he's the son of David, right? Because it says... David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, right? Right before that, the teacher of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David. Do you remember what we preached about earlier in the book of Mark? Do you remember the blind man Bartimaeus? Remember that sermon? Blind man Bartimaeus, when he cried out to Jesus to heal his eyes, what did he say? Jesus, son of David, right? He recognized that he was the Messiah. And Jesus is tying these things together. The Lord, the Father said to the Lord, me, sit at my right hand until I put all my enemies under your feet. I am the promised one to come. Why do you guys not believe it? And as the son of David, I'm what? I'm human. I'm in the bloodline of David. And Jesus was in the bloodline of David, right? He was his descendant. He was fully human. John 1.1, 1, 1, right? John 1.14. And the Word became flesh. Jesus became flesh. And He dwelt among us in His humanity. But also Jesus is also saying this. He's also saying that He's divine, right? If He wasn't saying He was divine, then why would the Lord said to the Lord? Why would the Father say to the next Lord, Him, that you're God? Except for that you're divine. So this is complicated stuff, but I'm trying to make it simple for you. Jesus is saying to the, to the scribes and the Pharisees, guess what? You guys still deny me. But the prophets have been speaking for me. And one of your greatest, King David, wrote Psalms 110, and he's pointing directly to me. He cannot be speaking about himself because it's God talking to God. Yahweh to Adonai. So how you interpret it that you're talking about the king is wrong. He's talking about me. I am that promised one. I am the Messiah. I am the Holy One of Israel. And I'm here in the flesh, the son of David, and in my divinity as Almighty God, both. And I am who I am. Both 100% God and 100% man. That's who I am. The transcendent figure of human history. Will you guys not listen to the great King David that you, that you follow and worship? Will you not listen to his own words about me? That's basically what he's saying. And what do we know the scribe's response is? I'm going to kill him. I'm going to get you. I'm going to wring your neck, Jesus. Right? But Jesus is saying, I am that one. He's confirming his identity. He's the Messiah who's both David's son in flesh and God's son in divinity. He is the one. What's very interesting is that this psalm is quoted 33 times in the New Testament. That tells you how important this prophecy about Jesus is. Very important. And in the church fathers seven times, there's a reason because it points directly to Jesus and who he is, and he clarifies. So it wraps up this in, Saul, in Romans 1, 1 through 4. Paul wraps it up for us. Paul, at the beginning of the book of Romans, his letter to the church at Rome says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, okay, stay there, concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul wraps all this up together and says, He's in the flesh, He's God, and He proves both. He proves He lives as a man and He dies as a man, and He proves that He's God because He rises from the dead. And so we worship Him. And Jesus is trying to clarify his identity for these guys. And so what's the application of this to us? 
The application of this is just like what we were talking about in Sunday school earlier. We have to be careful to reject false views of Jesus. The scribes had a false view of Jesus. Do people have a false view of Jesus today? Yes. Little bitty Delta County. I've been here only two years. We run into all kinds of groups of people that tell me. I've had multiple dinners with people and, and lunches that say, hey, Greg, all you're saying about Jesus is great, but Jesus isn't God. Or they say, Jesus is God, you're right, but Jesus isn't a man. He's the firstborn of God's. you got to be careful. You know, I say to people, define your terms when you say Jesus is God. What does that mean to you? And as soon as they start unpacking, I go, whoa, 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 whoa. The Scripture says this. We need to make sure that we're talking about the same Jesus. Right? There's false views of Jesus everywhere from this time to today's time. And it's important for you and I as followers of Jesus, how can you follow the one if you don't know what he's truly like, right? You and I need to know this Jesus. And we need to know him inside and out so well that we can spot the fake easily when it comes up and rears its ugly head. And we need to be the people that, according to 1 Timothy, gently instruct with great patience and careful instruction other people to lead them back to the truth. Because a false Jesus will lead them away from God. A false Jesus will lead them away from heaven. And it's important, as Jesus shows, as he clarifies with the religious leaders, you guys are religious. You're the, you're the founders of this. How come you don't know this? Is it possible for a pastor to have no clue who Jesus is? Please shake your head, yes. Yes. <laughs> it is. Right? A buddy of mine... He served with a fellow minister, and in one of the sermons, the fellow minister got down and confessed his sins and accepted Christ in the middle of his own sermon. This happened in Louisville, Kentucky. And when I talked to the man, he said, Greg, I preached for two and a half years on my first pastorate before I got the gospel. I could lay out the gospel, but I hadn't applied it to me. Jesus Christ dying for my sins and my evil, and that I desperately needed Jesus. And so I was preaching to all these people and helping them to come to Christ, and I didn't know Christ. By God's grace, he found Christ in his own sermon. And you want to talk about something neat? The people on the front row came and helped lead their pastor to Jesus Christ because they knew him first. What a great thing. What a, what a wonderful thing that each of you has the ability to share the great truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ, God and man, 100% of each, came to earth to live a perfect life, what we couldn't do, to die on the cross, to take our place as our substitute. We should have been on the cross. To bear the penalty of our sins, the punishment of God against it, and to give us his righteousness, that substitutionary atonement, those big words, but bottom line is, he took my whip in and he gave me his goodness. And, and that I, I get to share that with somebody else. And each of you, your testimony, you can clarify who Jesus is for somebody else. What a great gift we have to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus here says, guys, read the Bible. Learn about me, right? Get to know me. I dare you to get to know me through the word of God. And when I tell people to share about Jesus, I tell you guys, use your Bibles. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit works through His Word. It's living and active and it changes people's lives. It takes the spiritual blinders off their eyes. And it quickens, to use an old term. It moves their hearts. Those of you who've accepted Christ, do you remember that moment when your heart was quickened? That you recognized your sin and your need for Jesus? I remember it powerfully. And it was because of the Bible being shared with me by my children's church teacher. In every place we need to use the word. In every place we need to talk about Jesus. And so Jesus clarifies this. But then he's going to juxtaposition this against the condemnation of these religious leaders, right? Verse 38. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. Have the most important seats in the synagogues and the place of honor banquets. They devour, what a horrible term, right? They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. 
After Jesus clarifies who he is to them, he says, guess what? And I'm opposed to you. And the reason I'm opposed to you is because you're all about yourselves. I condemn you because you're all about you and you're not about other people, right? And he says, that's not how you're supposed to be as people of faith. He says, verse 38, that they live for the attention of other people, right? It says that they walk around in flowing robes to be greeted and respected in the marketplaces. They like the attention on who? I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man. That's how those guys were, right? And they liked their dress, right? They had flowing robes, full-length prayer shawls with tassels attached to the four corners. Today we see people that often are considered important, right? You go to the airport and you see a guy in a three-piece business suit. He's got his Bluetooth on and his little, his little iPad or his, his little uh, Microsoft Surface or something. He's got his PowerPoint pulled up. And what do we often think? He's an important guy. We, we, we like that. People like their titles. I am Dr. So-and-so. I worked with a minister that every time I said, hey, Gary, he said, it is doctor. Dude. <laughs> really? Dude, I played ball with you, and you weren't very good at it. I don't need to call you doctor, okay? <laughs> Dr. Gary. We went to seminary together, and I was better in Greek than you. I don't need to call you Dr. Gary. But he insisted, Greg, I am Dr. Gary. Dude, we're just Greg and Gary. Come on. You know? And they like to be greeted. People rise up and greet them, right, with those titles. They kind of thought they were hot stuff, right, verse 39. And they have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. You know, James talks about this in James chapter 2, the beginning of the chapter. He talks about when you see a wealthy man with a gold ring and a nice robe come in, and you say, here, have my seat, the place of honor at the top of the table. You show favoritism but another poor man comes in and you say you go stand over there or come sit at my feet James says haven't we become judges in our hearts right and then he says who are we to judge God's the only one who can do that we don't show favoritism right the best seat doesn't mean anything right and often in churches have we not seen pastors with with big thrones up on stage come on you guys watch them on tv Pastors of the big thrones on stage, right? And one time I had to preach at a buddy's church, and he had like three or four of those thrones that we all sat in. And I said, dude, I feel super uncomfortable. And he said, why? I said, I hate being up here. It's like we're better than everybody else. And he's like, oh, you're just fine. I was like, I cannot stand this. Right? Because who are we? We're just people like you, saved by the gospel of grace, right? But these guys thought they were better. They thought they were more. They, You know, today... The honored seats are where? In the back. Those back row Baptists. Everybody's clamoring for the back seat. You notice how the front is kind of thin? You notice how the back, there's not one that's open? Well, there's a couple over there. So in today's world, all those dudes would go to the back of the bus and sit back there. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, there goes point two, man. I got nothing after that. But Jesus... Jesus is saying, your problem is pride, right? He says, look at these guys. They boast, right? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.31, let him who boasts, boast in who? Boast in the Lord. That's the great apostle Paul who raised people from the dead, who got bit by the venomous snake and walked away from it, who was beaten and shipwrecked and all those things that God healed him when he was stoned and dead, got, or not dead, but almost there. God rose him up and healed him, right? And Paul says, if we're going to boast, we boast in only one person. You boast in the Lord, right? Outdo one another in showing honor to one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 10. Outdo each other. Be zealous to point to the other guy and say, you're better than me. God loves you. That's what we're supposed to be as the body of Christ. Philippians 2, look on the interests of others more than the interests of yourselves, right? Paul says, fight pride. Jesus says, you guys are filled with pride. You're dead men's bones your whitewashed tombs, as he says in other places, you're leading people away from me, and it's a problem because you're in love with yourselves and instead of being in love with Jesus. That's the problem. Pride kills us. Was well, this not the great sin of Satan? Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, that he, he wanted the place of prominence in heaven above the Most High, and he wanted to take the throne of Jesus. 
And Jesus says in the Gospels, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven because I'm the one who kicked him out. He was there. He did it. Right? 2 Chronicles 26.16 tells us about King Uzziah of Israel. It says he was a follower of Christ. He obeyed Jesus. But then he became more powerful. It says when Uzziah was strong, he grew proud to his own destruction. For he became unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense instead of the priests. He thought, I'm king. I can even do what the priests do. It didn't go so well for Uzziah. God will not share his glory. Right? Pride. We need to fight pride. It can happen to anyone. Athletes, actors, students, churches. Many, many pastors fall to pride. I love what Luther says. You know, next year is the 500th anniversary, or this year is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. October 31st, 1517. Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the church of the Catholic Church in Wittenberg, saying why he was breaking off for the purpose of the Word of God. And I love what Luther says about this. He says, grace is like water. It flows to the lowest point. So get low. I love that. Straight out of his catechism. Grace is like water. It flows to the lowest point. So get low. Right? If you want God's grace... You can't be prideful like these guys. That's the application. We need to fight pride. We need to go against pride. We need to be instead attracted to humility. We need to not be spiritual fakes. Because what does it say in verse 40? It says they devoured widows' houses. In today's term, we'd say they're gold diggers. These guys made their living off people giving to their cause, kind of like I do. You guys give of your offerings, and that's part, part of that pays for my salary, pays for my living. These guys lived high on the hog. They drove a a Ferrari by day's term. They wore an Armani suit, you know, in today's world. They had the highest end smartphone, the latest iPad, the whole nine. These guys, if they were living today, $100 million empires, you know. I mean, these guys were high on the hog. They were gold diggers while the poor widows were given all that they had in their generosity. And these men were sucking it up like a vacuum and killing them. How would you like for Jesus to say, you devour widows' houses about you? Ugh. Man, run, 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 right? So we need to fight against pride. And instead, true religion involves concern for social justice, right? And so we turn to the widow's offering. Verse 41, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put in and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. That's like the offering. And many rich people threw in large amounts. But a widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Jesus uses this as a teaching opportunity, this real event. And he says to his disciples as he called them to him, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put in more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their great wealth, but she gave out of her great poverty. She put in everything. All that she had, right? So juxtaposition, after he clarifies who he is, and he says, you guys are in love with yourself, and you deny me, and and you're just stripping people out for money. You religious leaders, well, guess what? This gal, she embodies all that it means to be a disciple of mine. While I condemn you, she understands who I truly am and what I truly teach, and I commend her for her great sacrifice, which is she's all in for Jesus, right? The issue was not money. The issue was heart. The issue was not amount. The issue was she was all in for Jesus. Now that ought to be a comfort for you today. Whether you give big or you give small, if you give from your heart and you give sacrificially to Jesus, Jesus may be smiling huge in heaven Because of what you do. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about service, time, treasure, talents, your ability with technology, all these things that we can give to serve the Lord. When we give them generously and sacrificially, God smiles in heaven. He is pleased by that. And he juxtapositions that against these religious guys. And he says, you devour, you devour widows' houses. And then, can you imagine it? He turns around, he points, and there's one of those widows you're sucking the life out of right there. 
and she's given everything that you're consuming for your own greed because she's given devotionally to God. And that's exactly what you should be like. Can you imagine what their eyes look like? Like Lee's sweater right there. I bet they grinded their teeth. I bet they were dreaming of ways of killing them with their own hands right there. we got to get rid of this guy. And they do, just a few days later. we got to stop him. He's turning people away from us. we got a good thing going here. This is a gravy train. And Jesus is stopping it because he's pointing people back towards God. Right? And, and the application for you and I is this. Isn't our job as followers of Christ here on the earth to point people towards the true Jesus and clarify him? And by definition, when you do that, you're drawing them away from false religion and false ideas of God. You're drawing them to the truth. And like I said, with gentleness, with respect, with great patience with people, with tenderness, you'll win them over with an attitude of love where you won't win them over by beating them down in an argument. What good is that? But as we're tender with people, as we're caring with people, as we draw people towards Jesus and they can see the true Jesus, then they're really drawn to him like a magnet, like a moth to a flame. Everywhere Jesus went, people were drawn to him. Children ran to Jesus, right? Mark 10. The religious leaders who hated him were drawn to Jesus. Women were drawn to Jesus. Men were drawn to Jesus. Blue collar, white collar, everything in between. Everybody was drawn to Jesus because that's the kind of God we serve. A loving, great, wonderful God. And so this woman, she puts in everything that she has. And so the, the idea is this, this idea of private devotion is greater than public performance. It's so much more important. And she's a model of faithfulness and generosity and sacrifice and devotion to God. And even though she'd be an unlikely example, she's exactly what the doctor ordered. She teaches us humility. That no matter what God's blessed us with, when we give it all back to Him, He smiles, He is pleased, and He does great things with it. So many people give for missions work. So many people give for the gospel. And you won't know until you get to heaven how many people have come to Christ because of it. You have no clue until you get there what God's done with that. With your sacrifice and your work and your service, right? Jesus is always watching our works. 1 Timothy 5, 24 and 25 says, God knows what we're doing, right? And as he sits here, you know, you can kind of say Jesus is a people watcher here, right? You guys ever sit in the mall and people watch? Downtown people watch? My father-in-law loves to people watch. He likes to sit and watch people and then laugh at them. <laughs> what did that guy just say? Did he say that to his wife? What? What? Hey, Greg, check this out. Look at this guy. You know, it's kind of fun. Jesus uses it for a little bit more noble purpose. He says, be like this woman. You see, Jesus knows what you give, and he's not worried about that. But he knows why you give, and he cares about that. It's the heart that matters. Our faith is a grace-based faith, right? Jesus calls us to himself because of his great love for us, not because of something we do, purely because of his grace. By grace, you are saved by faith. And then he, everything in our faith is about grace, where, where we deal with each other through grace, that we are loving and kind and tender to each other. We forgive each other. We're there for each other. We put each other before each other. That's what the church is supposed to be, an embodiment of that grace. And how we deal with people that don't know Jesus says whether we're people of grace too. It's where the heart is. Jesus was attracted to her sacrifice. This is what a great scholar says, James Edwards. In purely financial terms, the value of our offering is negligible and unworthy to be compared to the sums of the wealthy donors. But in the divine exchange rates of heaven, they look differently. That which made no difference in the books of the temple was immortalized in God's book of life. How powerfully ironic it is the word more in Mark's description. Everything about this woman had been described in terms of less, her poverty, she didn't have a husband. She didn't have money. She didn't have things. She was broke, particularly in contrast to the scribes and the wealthy crowd. And yet, 
the contrast between her genuine piety and faith and the pretense of the wealthy religious people is beyond compare. For Jesus, the value of a gift is not the amount given, but the cost to the giver. Jesus cares about your heart to give it all to him. You see, when we talk about stewardship here, it's not about you giving percent or about working in the children's nursery and all that. It's about all of life. It's about all of life. And when we don't communicate that, please forgive your elders, us for doing that. Forgive your pastor. That we don't communicate that enough. It's all of life. Everything belongs to Jesus. Your children, your vehicles, your house, your time, your talents, your abilities. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy that your ability to make wealth, God gave you. Every time somebody says, yeah, Greg, I worked hard. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and I did this. I made it. I had it. I want to gently remind them the strength that you had to pull up your bootstraps came from Jesus. Yeah, you did work hard. But God gave you that ability to do that. He gave you that strength. He gave you those talents. He gave you those abilities. And so all of life is about everything in our life being given back to Jesus. He gives it to us as a stewardship. What are you going to do with it? And he wants us to give it all back to him. And the widow's might is an example of that. It's not about kicking in a 20 or a 50 or 10% or whatever else. It's about everything belongs to Jesus. And that when we experience God's grace, that it produces generosity. When you think in your heart, about what God gave up for you, all that he sacrificed for you, all that he gave, his throne in heaven, living among sinful men, their rebuke and their hatred and their their punishment and their torture and their death upon him, and how he took the wrath of God in your place, and you look at all those things that Jesus has done for you and the grace that he gave you, the only appropriate response that comes out of a healthy heart is one of generosity. God, you've done, you gave up everything, Jesus, for me. Then I must give up everything for you. Everything belongs to you, God. Grace extends itself into generosity. And healthy people understand that the gospel is about grace, and you give it back, right? Jesus, it says in, in 2 Corinthians, loves a cheerful giver, right? We were receivers first of God's grace. And because of that, we turn around and we're cheerful givers. It's about the heart. Jesus clarifies who he is. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. I am fully man, the Son of David, and fully God, the Son of God. You guys don't understand. You're all about yourselves. Your pride's consuming you, and people around you, you're destroying the people around you. But this gal over here, she understands true faith in me because she's given back. Out of the grace that I've given her, she's given generously and sacrificially back. Isn't that what it's all about? When you and I go out into Delta County, we need to be thinking about how Jesus laid down his life for us and how in this text right here, he's one step closer to Golgotha. In just a couple chapters, he will go to his death for you and I. And we will look at that soon. And that should propel our behavior to our fellow man at school, at the marketplace, down at the gymnasium, at work, in our financial transactions, in our familiar relationships with other family members, in our relationships with our neighbors. The grace of God should bleed through us and back out generously. That's what it's all about. When we truly understand who Jesus is and what he's done for us, we easily give it back. I'm going to leave you with this thought, the old hymn. We talk about the hymn sing on, on Tuesday night. There's an old hymn that says, Jesus paid it all. What? All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Talking about on my soul. In Jesus, he washed it white as snow. Right? When we understand that deep theology, it's easy for us to start giving different corners of the shadows of our lives to Jesus that we've been holding back. I don't know what God's talking to you about this morning, but I pray that whatever that is, that during this altar time that you'll do business with Jesus. Maybe you need to pray for yourself or somebody else. Maybe you need to come and confess some sin and make sure that you're right with God. That's what this altar's for. Maybe you need to 
accept Jesus for the first time, you're like those Pharisees. You didn't understand him. You didn't understand who Jesus was. But now you truly do from the word of God, and you say, I need that. I need Jesus. What do I do with that? Pastor, what do I do with that? Come. I'd love to share that with you. Whatever that is, whatever God's talking to you about. Other areas of obedience. Now's the time to declare that and to do that, okay? As the band comes and we pray, let's pray.